Um, so welcome everybody, whether you're here in the Kislak uh, or zooming in from points beyond to this session of the Spring 24 Workshops in the History of Material Texts. I'm Jerry Singerman, Humanities Editor Emeritus of the University of Pennsylvania Press and one of the current conveners of the workshop, along with Zach Lesser, the Edward W. Kane Professor of English at Penn, and John Pollock, uh, Curator for Research Services here in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts. We're aided, as always, by Lila Goldenberg of the Penn History Department and the current Bristol Schoenberg Fellow in the History of Material Texts. Now, a few familiar housekeeping matters. For those of you who are in the room with us, please do sign the attendance sheet as it goes around. And if you're not already on our list serve and would like to be, make that happen by adding your email address. Also, in consideration of our remote attendees, I ask, generally in vain, um, that when the time comes for discussion, really do try to speak more loudly than you might think necessary so that your voice may be audible to our remote participants who are numerous. Now, for those of you who are joining us remotely, please mute yourselves, of course, during the presentation, but make yourselves heard by posing questions or comments by using the chat function, which Lila will be curating. During the Q&A, please raise your little cartoon hands so that we may call upon you and hear from you directly. Now, amazingly enough, we've now rounded the final curve of the semester and we're on the home stretch with just four more sessions of this academic year's workshops to go after tonight. We'll hear next week from Lila, who will move from the side table to the center position <laughs> uh, to talk about the manuscript solutions to the problem of cataloging books in the Bodleian Library in the 17th century. She'll be followed a week later by Shenzhen Lu of Bates College, presenting on popular literature and manuscript culture in 17th through 19th century rural China, and the week after that by Marina Garona Gravier of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, who'll be speaking on printed books in indigenous languages in colonial Latin America. We'll cross the finish line with a flourish, as we generally do, with a presentation by Roger Chautier on books as portfolios on April 29th. But today we're pleased to have Anne Sharif once more at Penn and in our material texts orbit. Sharif earned her PhD in Japanese literature from the University of Michigan and moved on from there to Case Western Reserve, where she was assistant professor of Japanese between 1991 and 1996. From there, she moved on to Oberlin College, where she is professor of Japanese and East Asian studies, teaching a wide range of courses in Japanese language and literature, cinema, theater, gender studies, and not least, book history. She's also a member and sometime chair of the college's committee overseeing the concentration in book studies, and she heads an ongoing project to digitize and interpret the more than 300 Japanese artist books in the Oberlin Library's Ainsworth collection. You can find her digital exhibit, Popular Protest in Post-War Japan, the Anti-War Art of Shikoku Goro, on the library's website. Sherry's work has been supported by the NEH and the Freeman, Mellon, and Luce Foundations, among others. Among her many published articles and book chapters, she highlights Book Histories, Material Culture, and East Asian Studies, published in Verge, Studies in Global Asia, and Gariban Paint, Printing and Social Movements in 20th Century Japan, forthcoming in the volume Japan in the 1950s, as likely to be of particular interest to this group. She's the author of Japan's Cold War, Media, Literature, and the Law, which was published by Columbia University Press in 2009, and is currently writing a monograph on independent and regional publishers in 20th century Japan, with a particular focus on print and visual culture of Hiroshima. This afternoon, she promises to draw on Penn's own Arthur Tress collection, some of which is sitting um, in the middle of this room, um, to present on Hokusai's page spread, a filial, filial piety book in early modern Japan. So please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Anshu. <laughs> uh, I'm the wrong person to ask. So. There I am, right Yeah. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. People online can hear me? Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I'm really honored to be here at the 
uh, material text um, workshop um, and at this wonderful uh, University of Pennsylvania Libraries and the Kislak um, Center. Uh, and and uh, a great treat to be at such a premier site of book studies and book histories uh, in the United States and the world. Um, thank you to Lila and Jerry, um, Julie, um, and John, and everyone here who have, have uh, hosted me. Uh, thank you for your support and for bringing me here. I, as Jerry noted, uh, my real research, my real research is on actually 20th and 21st century uh, <clears throat> literature and arts activism and publishing in Japan. And my current project on Hiroshima, so I'm feeling a little bit of an imposter syndrome here, but I have been, thanks to uh, Julie Davis and Linda Chance and others, uh, been, uh, been an amateur student of uh, pre-modern Japanese books for uh, quite a while now, for more than a decade or maybe two, um, and uh, have learned a lot by uh, studying books, handling books, uh, and uh, especially teaching books with the collection in our library at Oberlin. I will just briefly say that uh, one reason I'm, I chose this topic of filial piety books, which probably sound, seems very obscure, is because I found of our collection at Oberlin uh, of about 150 pre -modern, early modern Japanese books, we have a high percentage of filial piety books in the collection. So I was trying to figure out what is that about? And we started looking at them and comparing them. There were ones from China, from Korea, from Japan. They all look different. They were clearly aimed at different audiences. Some of them were in English, uh, and they were all in the vernacular. And I thought maybe because of Oberlin's missionary roots and Christian roots, the uh, Oberlin missionaries who went abroad were interested in ethics and morals and spirituality of places, people in uh, other lands where they visited. And so we have this high uh, uh, concentration. So we, uh, we have, uh, this is a topic that I was trying to make sense of for a long time. So in my presentation today, I offer some uh, just preliminary remarks about the function and material, re materiality of didactic books in early modern Japan. Uh, as the Tress collection demonstrates, early modern readers in Japan enjoyed access to an impressive, an impressive <laughs> assortment of books on literature, art, entertainment, stories of the supernatural, folk tales, erotica, Buddhist sutras, parodies of the classics, romances, poetry, medicine, tales of vendettas, travel, mathematics, kabuki, theater, and anything you could ever want in a book. So why would anyone want to, uh, of their own accord, read a book about filial piety, about loyalty, <laughs> respect for elders, and one's place in society, and especially about paragons of moral virtue? Today, I will briefly introduce the genre of didactic books in early modern Japan with a focus on uh, several examples, uh, books that are cataloged at Penn libraries and most libraries in the United States as uh, books about filial piety, children, parents and children. Uh, but I'd like to distinguish three main types among these filial piety books. And then I will outline the interest briefly of commercial publics and famous artists like Katsushika Hokusai uh, in uh, publishing these uh, and expanding the concept of didactic books in response to the needs of diverse readers and a highly competitive commercial book market in the uh, 17th through 19, mid 19th century in Japan, as Julie Davis has so uh, wonderfully written about. So Hokusai, Katsushika Hokusai, likely most uh, of us in the room uh, will associate uh, this uh, uh, famous, probably one of the most famous Japanese artists in the world, not with pictures like this, kind of a self-portrait of him uh, <laughs> painting with many brushes. But we probably, when we think of Hokusai, we probably think of the way uh, and again, I recommend Julie, uh, Julie's uh, book uh, uh, and, and the reading of the particular image uh, under yeah. the, the way that uh, Or and perhaps my tie in it there. There we go. And John has a great wave tie yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, I think the, these uh, hoax size portrayals of Mount Fuji, such as the Red Fuji and so on, are well known and well, lo well loved. 
uh, recently, the New York Times uh, journalist Michiko Kakitani uh, put the great wave on a cover of her most recent book. Uh, and we see that uh, the market, our mar market well, uh, is uh, loving uh, Hokusai and, and uh, the high prices, $2.8 million for just a single sheet print of the Great Waves. So these are uh, well-known, iconic images that, that what usually comes to mind when we think of Katsushika Hokusai. Today, however, I would like to think about uh, his, some of his other uh, production, and that is specifically as illustrations of books. Uh, I'll look at th uh, several titles that are in, here in Penn's Tress collection and also in special collections in relation to their attunement to uh, early modern Japanese uh, and the military, military dictatorship, the shogun's priorities and po policies of uh, promoting didactic books as tools of persuasion. So on the one hand, we have the top down, the shogunate, uh, encouraging publications and, and distribution of didactic books uh, in order to communicate the types of morally correct behavior that the authorities wish to promote or discourage, and at the same time, prioritizing competition for readers' imaginations and customers' money. Uh, Julie Davis uh, points out the collaboration among early modern publishers and their creative contributors in informing, impressing, and delighting their audiences while also turning a profit. So that's a very important context of these uh, didactic and filial piety books. These books, among others, show that the makers of early modern didactic books follows these same kinds of practices. So today I'll focus on uh, three main types of uh, didactic or filial piety books in early modern Japan that were wildly pop popular. Type number one. Uh, this is called, uh, this is a technical term, a bibliographic term. You can't tell a book by its cover. Um, students, please note that down. <laughs> uh, so can't tell, if anybody actually knows a better ter an actual term for this, please let me know. Um, so the type number one, this, these are uh, didactic texts that invoke uh, authoritative texts such as Confucian Analects or the classics of fil filial piety that come from China. Uh, that invoke uh, authoritative figures such as Confucius um, himself, and the uh, usual initial text and image tend to be of those very authoritative continental models. Uh, they, these uh, type number one also tend to have paratexts of uh, classical text uh, and commentary or exegesis in, in vernacular. And they elevate Japanese examples of, say, virtuous people, of military heroes of leaders uh, that, uh, elevate Japanese examples uh, to the level of the Chinese or continental uh, ancient models. Uh, however, uh, the further one gets in uh, past the initial cover and uh, the initial pages, uh, we find these books uh, uh, not being as solemn and serious, ethically serious as we would expect, and we have stunning and entertaining pages and uh, images design. Uh, example we'll look at is the illustrated class, ancient classics of filial piety. The second type uh, we'll see is what you see as what is what you get. Uh, and these, uh, this uh, technical category, number two, what you see, what you get, is what I would think of, maybe we think today as civics books, uh, books that represent exemplars of filial piety, how to be loyal, how to be faithful, um, how to be a good person. Uh, and as inspiration to a more popular audience for whom historical conditions dictate a top-down state, but who in lived experience seek role models and ways of being in the world. So the best known of this type is uh, 24 Exemplars of Filial Piety, Mizu Shiko, of which uh, there's an example uh, on the table. Uh, and in this, it represents proper behavior of children uh, in relation to their parents and their elder elders. And finally, the third type uh, that, uh, interestingly enough, there are not many examples here in the glorious uh, collections uh, at the Penn Libraries. Type number three are the encyclopedic books, um, such as the ones that are titled Greater Learning, whose titles advance their didactic use in daily living, but whose very thick pages, and often these are big tomes, include not only morality, right, um, this kind of filial piety, but also how to do your hair, how to uh, good calligraphy models, 
stories from uh, popular literature or the literary classics, poetry, all sorts of practical matters as well. And the resilience and importance of didactic books in Edo period Japan is demonstrated by the ubiquity of these main types, along with readers' abilities to choose from even more types, because there are, are indeed more types of popular books on filial piety and virtuous living, from biographies, virtuous children tales, and other genres. Now, um, so some of these, I start with a earlier uh, example of uh, some of the di didactic books in the, from the 17th century, uh, which tended to be uh, filial piety books, uh, uh, tended to be text only. We would read the, the uh, Confucian or, or the followers of Confucian's words about correct, virtuous, and filial behavior uh, and, and the order of the, of the universe uh, as well, the realm as well. But the, the editions of the filial piety books here in the Tress collections are distinctive because of the stature of the artist commissioned to illustrate, none other than Hokusai. But in another sense, they are completely familiar type of books to Edo period readers, the kind of book that I would argue that didn't just come from the top down, but that readers actively sought out in bookshops and wanted to include in their libraries. Uh, although many of us associate Hokusai with these sheet prints, Hokusai spent much of his career illustrating books and books of all sorts, from popular prose fiction, erotica, to landscapes, drawing manuals for aspiring artists, poetry books, and there's an example of a poetry book uh, on uh, in the pleasure quarters on the table, and of course his very famous Hokusai manga or sketchbooks. Hokusai also illustrated several what are called Chinese books, like the ones that we have here, the ones that talk about Confucian morality and ethics. While the uh, government, the state, the shogunate, and local authorities promoted these filial piety books as a means of bolstering, indeed preserving the social order, centering on military, uh, the military class's rule, and framed in neo-Confucian thought, over time, readers of all classes gravitated to these books precisely because the editors, publishers, and illustrators created books that tailored their messages to the audience's tastes. In turn, these material texts reveal their consumers' interests. And interests here are not only aesthetic and cultural interests, but also interests in being a virtuous and valued member of the family, of the community, and also the political realm. These values and behaviors were integral to early modern social fabric and to people's identities. So how can we read filial piety books that visually leap and textually leap beyond the confines of didactic uh, literature and poetry? And this example is one of the kind of uh, classic of filial piety that you'd open a page after page of text, text, text of Chinese. And most Japanese readers did not read Chinese without a lot of help or without a Japanese translation. Okay? So clearly these were not the type that um, would sell in the market. In early modern Japan, the shogunate advanced Neo-Confucian social structures and values. The, the military samurai class ruled Japan during a long period of cultural effervescence and relative prosperity and peace generated by a thriving commercial public, uh, publishing industry centering on three major cities, Kyoto, Osaka, and Tokyo, uh, Edo, excuse me, today Tokyo, and also a rise in, a huge rise in popular literacy. The examples before us here, uh, differ from books with the same titles earlier uh, in the uh, period in the 1700s as subsequent publishers, editors, and illustrators added, such as Hokusai added new knowledge and uh, illustrations and admitted others to meet the interest of their readers. The shogunate encouraged didactic books for social integration and affirmation of their, their Confucian ideologies that articulated the social order, even as historical conditions of a burgeoning proto- capitalist economy and social change encouraged artists and publishers to align didactic titles with readers and con consumers' expectations. So what is filial piety? Maybe this isn't a familiar word uh, to a lot of us. This is actually a very elastic concept. Filiality, uh, kind of respect and bonds with, with other people basically is a fundamental. It's a concept um, and value that is not stat static. And let me talk just for a second about the range of meanings over time that are articulated, especially in these books um, that we see. Filiality uh, could be uh, being a virtuous person in, in many ways, uh, knowing one's place and knowing one's relationships with others. Uh, that can uh, be self-sacrifice uh, self of a child, 
for the parents' needs, putting the parents' needs over their own needs, right? Uh, it can be loyal and obedience to a higher status family member uh, or the community. It can be maintaining emotional bonds. Uh, an interesting part of filial filiality in being versus person in early modern Japan was developing literacy, becoming a literate person, a highly literate and, and well-read person uh, for men and women to different degrees, but also becoming a per persuasive speaker so one could advocate uh, for one's uh, family and one's community unit. So relevant to the two types of filial piety books we'll look at today is the idea of filiality as a type of bond between family members, but also filiality as the bonds, the proper um, and acceptable normative bonds between ruler and ruled. Um, um, so on all these levels, family, community, and uh, political uh, state. So we'll look at uh, three types of books here in the Penn libraries, uh, I'm sorry, two types. Um, and the first of these, uh, maybe this looks, uh, the, this is the illustrated ancient classical of fil filial piety, the um, uh, Gahon or Ehon Kobun Kokyo, published in 1850. And here we see the opening spread uh, with on uh, on the right side um, that gives the title uh, of, of uh, the, the work uh, in the middle uh, from top to bottom. And also on the right, uh, reading from top to bottom uh, in the right rectangle, we see the name of the illustrator who's featured, uh, Katsushika Hokusai. Hokusai. Uh, and on the left uh, is the um, publisher's uh, name, Kuzambo. Uh, the left, uh, uh, this uh, spread on the left is part of the preface. Uh, and this is the cover. Um, again, this is type one, can't tell a book by a cover. And with their claims made uh, in this last slide about this is a serious book uh, that takes us back to uh, to the continental models and to Confucius. And indeed, that we turn the next page and who do we see? But a portrait of Confucius uh, himself is very conventional and a preface by a Japanese uh, writer of, uh, <clears throat> of fiction. However, then what happens? Oh, and I just wanted to pause, this is a material text, pause to think that these are all um, woodblock printed books. So the text and the images are all woodblock printed uh, and uh, xylographic printing. And we see here, this isn't from the book that I'm just talking about, but this is, uh, uh, I think you can see, uh, there's the piece of the printing block uh, and then the printed uh, text uh, next, to, next to it. So this genre of filial piety and uh, didactic books uh, show uh, something else to us too. So anybody who would pick these up initially, but then think, well, what's beyond the cover, um, tells it, helps us think about the diversity of readers in early modern Japan. So, and why did they read, the reasons for reading, and among cohort or, co cohorts of these readers, what the roles of these particular sub class of books were in the lives of women and girls, men and boys, their status class, their socioeconomic class, a very uh, diversifying uh, society. So rather than top-down ideological books forced on unwilling readers, a subset of these didactic books, and especially those illustrated by Hokusai, were these filial piety books provided readers with means to define their roles in the family and society and offer ethical compasses and valorized reading and writing as central. Uh, other books in this category uh, promoted development of national identity, I would argue, by elevating Japanese culture in relation to the um, much older uh, and, uh, continental Chinese culture through just juxtaposition of Sinaitic and Japanese text and image on the page. Okay. Um, and um, at the same time, uh, witnessing active uh, Sino-Japanese exchange, when Hokusai went to these Chinese sources for materials, he evoked not contemporary China, not China of the 19th century, but an idealized ancient past uh, created a kind of imaginary world of China. A mature audience in his 70s and still at the top of his game when he illustrated these books, uh, Hokusai had a perfect understanding of what could be accomplished by the woodcut medium and the book page and saw no need for color printing. 
Hokusai employed transposition, often creating respectful but lighthearted reinterpretation of, of traditional cultural modes. And Hokusai, in this uh, representative of, uh, of his ways, ukiyo-e creators uh, were in dialogue with uh, both visual cultural age. And we know that Hokusai was also inspired by and deeply influenced by Western visual culture uh, and, and different modes of Japanese uh, visual culture as well. So just to pause for a second, uh, again, to look, think about the xylographic printing. These are uh, pictures of uh, a uh, contemporary Hanga artist, um, uh, Asaka uh, Motoharu in Tokyo, uh, carving uh, blocks of the Great Wave and then using the baden uh, with a piece of uh, washi paper placed on, uh, on each block uh, for this multi, this polychrome uh, single sheet print. You notice his tools and his inks here too. Uh, and this is a, a contemporary artist who's at Wesleyan, uh, Keiji Shinohara uh, at the Smithsonian Institution. There are wonderful uh, videos of him uh, demonstrating woodblock prints uh, that I recommend to you highly, uh, placing the, uh, uh, very carefully the uh, washi paper on the woodblocks, um, especially in polychrome uh, or even uh, monochrome with different colors of gray and so on. Um, uh, very uh, precise and, and difficult work. So the uh, when we get into the illustrated classics of filial piety, uh, the readers also have many, many choices. Okay? So even if we don't want to slog through the preface, and we usually don't read the rest of the preface, when we get uh, to the uh, actual pages of uh, uh, text page facing image page, we see uh, we have many choices. We can read the chunks of the original text of indeed the uh, classics of filial piety was written in second century BCE in China. Uh, so it's very ancient text. So there's just little snatches of, of that text, but there, there's copious Japanese vernacular commentary that we can read in, in the likely event that we can't read the Chinese. Uh, and, and there's also a uh, kanbu kundoku, which is Chinese with Japanese interpreted marks to, to so we can rearrange uh, the Chinese uh, uh, in this kind of translationese uh, in Japanese order and make some kind of sense of it. Uh, the, uh, then we get a little further in, we're still sticking with the continental models. And we have this wonderful page that shows this uh, uh, Songzu, who is one of the disciples of Confucius, there on the right, uh, the large um, rectangular uh, picture on the right. These are all Hokusai's um, images. Uh, and the four uh, status classes of uh, uh, samurai, warrior, uh, peasant, uh, artisan, and merchant, okay, uh, modified to Japanese needs. But then something changes. All of a sudden, <laughs> rather than having uh, lofty, uh, heavy uh, Confucian ancient texts, uh, we have ourselves finding uh, examples, exemplars uh, of warriors. Okay, so we have this situating of warriors uh, as exemplars uh, of, of virtuosity, doing maybe virtuous things. Uh, the the uh, figure on your left. Uh, is it says the text in the upper right of that page uh, is, says that he's it was in, in the time of battle and somebody is sacrificing himself and you can see that there's a sword going right through him and he's plummeting to the earth. A very kind of uh, interesting and um, hoaxi like example of of, um, of illustration. Right? So all of a sudden we've, we've uh, gone and this is a Japanese setting. It's not a Chinese setting. On the right, uh, it's again, it's a Japanese setting and um, somebody who's, I think, uh, something about the moon, I have to study that to know, but these are these are all different kind of vignettes or stories of famous historical uh, figures, uh, military figures, Japanese figures who are then put in this, um, this uh, context.
So the uh, image pages are interspersed with the text pages, but clearly the image pages are much more interesting. Uh, and a lot of these we can see the uh, uh, Folksby's brilliance of de design too. This is a, a page spread at opening. Uh, and these are actually, uh, um, there's two thirds of the page is one image and then the, uh, the third of the page to the left is another, uh, yet it looks like they're related, but then we have fun studying how these are uh, both separate uh, examples of virtuous people. So there's a lot of puzzles and a lot of uh, fun things for um, readers to look at. Because these are other examples from the same book. So books, well, in other words, books of this type, number one, uh, make claims of proximity to revered Confucian classics and powers, yet uh, in the title page of the image, but rather than showing a series of ordinary acts of reverence of child for parents, behaviors and feelings based in ethical beliefs and respect and duty as essential to maintaining harmony, this trust collection editions of, for example, the classic of filial piety, takes the reader on this really best breathtaking visual exploration of, exploration of classical and vernacular Japanese narr uh, narratives uh, and puts them on the same level as uh, Chinese. Uh, this is, they're also entertainers. Uh, the figure on your right is a Shirabyoshi, a very famous kind of a dancing figure who is, uh, is portrayed often in no theater and Kabuki theater uh, and in classical literature too. Uh, a woman who uh, performs in public. Uh, the figures on the left are uh, dengaku, uh, kind of acrobats, and an early form of street uh, performance. So Hokusai gives us a little bit of everything. I'm not quite sure how, how these are virtuous or filial, <laughs> but there's some, there's some way to construe of that. Uh, we even get uh, Matsuo Basho, the most, one of the most famous poets in, of, of Japan, uh, the most famous uh, haiku poet here uh, with a haiku poem. Uh, quoted here um, and, and just really on the uh, left-hand side here, um, you see Haiku, uh, I'm sorry, Basho, uh, standing on a precipice looking down. This is uh, a, a work from Hookside's uh, uh, later life when he was in his 70s. So another example here we have uh, that's on the, also on the table is the illustrated loyalty, the Ehon Chikyo, uh, uh, a classic of loyalty. And here, instead of as in Confucius, we see uh, uh, a portrait of Hokusai himself <laughs> uh, in the place where we, in, in the previous book, we had uh, Confucius. And he's looking, but he's looking rather Confucian in his uh, proximity to books and, and he's got a brush, uh, but it's been a long day. <laughs> okay. This illustrated loyalty, you'll see this is a wonderful example if you want to see that the bugs in Japan uh, did, that uh, loved this book. I don't know if it was the dyes here in this color preface, the decorative preface, but please do take a look at this later. Um, this is not as well known. The, uh, the, earlier, the first book that I gave you is a very well known example um, of, uh, uh, of Hope Size book and, and was ubiquitous and, and widely circulated across the Japan. This one is, is not as well known. You can see it has a, a similar format. Uh, the last page, we have the publication information uh, and it shows, uh, um, among other things, it advertises the other so-called Chinese books include that Hope Size illustrated, the illustrated Tang poetry and the illustrated uh, the real piety. So the second type uh, that I will be um, in, uh, to move on to, and I'd also wanted to mention about these kind of books. Uh, when you look at these, these are all, uh, we are looking at these in digital images, uh, the op this opening or the spread uh, as if they are sheet prints. They're not, of course, not sheet prints, uh, but these are all, uh, all the examples here. I hope you'll have a chance to look at the binding carefully. They're all side stitched books, Kuro Toji. Uh, with the soft, uh, thick washi paper uh, covers, often with uh, recycled or some other kind of liner for the cover, and a very durable washi paper made with kozo or mulberry uh, that is just perfect for uh, printing uh, uh, this kind of wood, xylographic woodblock printing. So I hope you have all the chance to, to handle those. Uh, and those of you on Zoom, come by the library and, and see them in person, please. 
So the second type of uh, uh, book, uh, what you see is what you get, what I was calling the civic books, uh, that are books that offer paragons or of exemplars of uh, filial piety. And this is, uh, I would call it kind of uh, a directory of virtuous people. Uh, these are very popular books for broad readerships. And one of the examples here on the table, which is not an example of, uh, from the Tress collection, but from the special collection here, the Niji Shko, the 24 examples of filial piety, are based on Chinese stories, uh, vernacular stories that were circulated widely throughout China and then throughout Korea and Japan and Vietnam as well, uh, with the same set of 24 stories of exemplary children. Uh, and their uh, attitudes to their um, parents, their their respect, and often self-sacrifice, and sometimes uh, almost masochistically so, sacrificing so much that um, that they do harm to themselves. Uh, so the, this is widely known. Uh, probably more people read these and saw these images than any of the other uh, books that Hoxai illustrated. Uh, this is actually not a hope site, uh, for that, but I bring this from a, a, a single sheet print. Uh, many other artists uh, did uh, uh, illustrations and sheet prints of the 24 paragons of filial piety, and so in various formats. This is by Kunio uh from uh, the Allen Memorial Art Museum at Oberlin, uh, and it's the very first uh, uh, and well known. Uh, I'm guessing there might be some people here who know this uh, very first uh, story. So this the first uh, the first story is about a, um, a young man uh, who uh, wanted uh, was so uh, respectful and loyal to his parents even though his parents were actually very cruel to him and um, uh, he went out and they uh, went out in the field worked out hard, hard in the field to feed his family uh, and so filial was he that he moved heaven and earth. And even nature came out, the elephants and the, the birds came out to help him work in the field because they, his attitude of, of, of filiality was so admirable. And the emperor of the day, the Chinese, Chinese story, the emperor of the day uh, was so impressed by this that then he, that young, young boy grew up to become the next emperor, uh, an emperor of China. And so that's, those are the re potential rewards of filiality. Uh, this is a uh, one of the uh, additions from the Oberlin College uh, uh, section, and I see you had this is actually the same I think the same book as you have here from special collections at Penn. Uh, this is, uh, on the right, you see the cover uh, with the the title slip that says the twenty four uh, the illustrated twenty four virtuous exemplars of filial piety, uh, and then you see the the page spread here. Um, with the same same story, uh, and the uh, this is a very common page format mat of Japanese and Chinese books with illustrations across the bottom and then text across sometimes the top half or the top third of the page, um, and uh, you can see that this one is uh, uh, monochrome; it's not in color. Uh, here's another example of uh, uh, another very famous uh, story where you see from the Harvard uh, University Library uh, from 1686, so it's rather early, uh, but again, you see it's a different page format. Um, uh, in the writing on the top is both in Chinese, uh, but also in the Japanese vernacular, so anyone uh, in Japan with a certain degree of literacy would be able to, to read this. So I'm just going to um, one one more section that I'd like to discuss here about filial piety. Um, and the claim I made earlier in my talk was that uh, filial piety, these filial piety books, even though they were inc certainly encouraged by the state um, and uh, the values, the Confucian values uh, on on all levels, familial, individual, community, and and uh, uh, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, hegemonic authorities, 
Uh, these were all values that, that were strongly encouraged by the shogunate of, of early modern Japan. At the same time, I argued that these are not just top-down uh, propaganda books that were forced on people that people didn't want to, to read. In fact, people did uh, eagerly buy these and, and commercial publishing of commercial market uh, uh, made these books uh, entertaining and, and uh, attractive. But there were other uh, interesting uh, and important aspects of, of filial piety, right? So if we go back to medieval and late imperial China, we see epitaphs and biographies of women. So if we think about women as readers and writers, that frequently admi uh, mention adm uh, admiringly the reading habits of deceased virtuous women. So one of the, the, the things that we would admire about the person who died was that she was well-read, she was literate, and she read often you know, in, in a disciplined way. Um, and uh, there also one of the epitaphs uh, from China, and these these books all came into Japan during these uh, these uh, centuries as well. Um, they, a particular woman uh, in uh, Japan in China, I'm sorry, named Bo Lu, was said uh, said she mastered texts such as the classic of filial piety. She knew how to read them, and she understood them. She internalized them. She could recite all of them and initiate imitated the mo models of virtuous women of ancient times. She was also good at writing, but she never showed off. She took responsibility for all household affairs that needed to be done. So in China, as, which were the examples for all these books and, and uh, uh, philosophical and ethical uh, models that came into Japan and then were uh, domesticated and used in, in, in uh, many different ways in Japan, in China, there were many incentives to establish one's name through filial acts, and through stories about filiality. So these story, storytelling and also showing through images for a broader readership were really, really important in establishing one's own identity, sense of self, but also one's reputation uh, in one's community and in the state. And in China, the state would recognize virtuous acts by putting up a banner or a plaque in the village, say, or rewarding families with filial exemplars from the leaf with taxes. Not a bad deal, right? If you're a virtuous person, you don't have to pay so much taxes. I would joke with that. And they also enhance people's uh, opportunities, uh, men, I assume, for public office. Now, and similarly in Japan, there were actually some of the books types we see published, uh, I think especially locally, were uh, directories of virtuous people. And this particular example uh, is from the Hiroshima area in Western Honshu, Western, uh, Western Japan. Uh, and between uh, these are this is a directory of local people who were deemed uh, in their uh, understanding of themselves, in their behavior, and their uh, uh, presentation to the community and, and contributions to the community as virtuous. Uh, the authorities, the uh, shoguns and the local daimyo, uh, issued commendations for virtuous acts after 1801. And the uh, domains actually printed directories listing actual people who had distinguished themselves through filial behavior. Uh, in the Hiroshima region, for example, and that's just one part of Japan, 35 editions of these directories of virtuous people, and you can see were issued uh, in the first half of this point, well, in less than that, within about 40 years, uh, and in which a total of 850 exemplary virtuous local people were celebrated. And that's just one region of Japan. And you can not notice here too, that the format of the directories is very much like the formats of the books that we saw uh, illustrated by uh, none other than Hokusai that had a much, much greater claim. So uh, over time and in different communities, fil filial piety is neither uniform nor solely authoritatively imposed. Uh, through books and theater, uh, filial piety and images did become the subject of public acclaim. The commercial publishers, like the commercial publishers that Hokusai worked with, uh, commissioned an artist of the stature of the Hokusai late in his career, a mature and well-known artist, highly renowned in his own time to illustrate the edition that we saw earlier and that's here on the table. And that gives us an idea of some of the mechanisms through which filial piety became so prominent in the public consciousness. So I'm going to wind down there, but I just in closing, uh, uh, say that this paper has considered the range of expectations that early modern Japan Japanese readers may have brought with them 
when reading the delightful and edifying illustrated classics of filial piety illustrated by Hopsai. And I hope that these tentative remarks, uh, building on the research of Yamamoto Yoshitaka, Julie Davis, Peter Kornitsky, Eliotinos, Tirios, uh, Marcia Yonemoto, and many other people, will spur interest in further research, I'm looking at the students in the room, further research on the Trust Collection books on filial piety and other topics. Uh, and uh, I argue that filial piety is a resilient and relevant genre of books that flourished in early modern Japan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. <clears throat> and the floor is open for questions, comments, and Liliana has her hand raised. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I love And listening to you, I felt that I heard people different stories about different times. One is a story that I felt I can relate to. That was the relationships of children, the people, young local elders of the world in the community. Something that was brought forward by the sound of stories to the sort of education. These are stories that are a little bit more complicated. I have no sense of what I'm talking about. Mm. And that's the thing that I took to the most. Mm. Mm. And there was so much going on that we didn't think about. So, mm. Just wanted to be elevated to the mountains. Confucius was there. The older examples might have been Confucius. Uh, Chinese writing was used. Uh, books were imported. Mm -hmm. But surely it was not just the Chinese things that people had and came into this level, but China had its own kind of traditions. And I wondered has that been reworked? In the reception to the comment, I'm sorry to put it so very mm -hmm. heavy, that I use. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what somebody you also look at somebody from the and then you have this Chinese mm -hmm. So, how did it happen mm -hmm. that kind of filial piety and self education? Oh, thank you for that wonderful question. Um, yeah, no, the the uh, kind of national level <laughs> is very, very complicated, as you suggest, too. Um, and especially because these are, this is, these are 19th century books when um, you know, there, there are so many things going on in the 19th century that Japan is, uh, if we start at, in Japan, is feeling the kind of the pressure or the threat from, from the outside. Uh, and in contemporary China, of course, the great powers are coming in and ravaging China, and that kind of dream China of uh, Confucians and the, the, this kind of perfect uh, imaginary realm that is suggested in those opening pages is in a state of civil war and disarray and threatened by you know, opening wars and so many other uh, geopolitical issues and problems. Um, Just stop sharing. Stop sharing, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Is that good? Yes. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, so, um, and also, you know, the, and also domestically too, the valorization of, of the, the offering of so many examples of dramatic and heroic and, and apparently bloodless um, <laughs> uh, sacrifice, uh, virtuous warriors too. Which uh, you know, this was a time of defeat. The warrior class didn't really have a function except ruling, uh, and the world was changing so rapidly. So in some ways, these pictures of these these perfect, bloodless, <laughs> heroic, virtuous. Warriors are a way of, 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 of I know I wouldn't call it nostalgia, but a, um, trying to reframe or redefine what warrior classes are, just as exactly as that whole world is slipping away. And I don't know if that answers your question. Um, it, it gives me an intrigue 
Yeah, Zach. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things that, you know, when we have presentations on East Asian books, it's always very interesting to me, by contrast with European books of the same period, is, is the fact that the text and the image are printed using the same technique, whereas, of course, mm -hmm. in Europe, mm -hmm. a good thing about woodblock illustration in, in European printing is actually printed at the same time as mm -hmm. text, but not with the same medium. Mm -hmm. And so then that, I think leads me to ask about the illustrations in particular, mm -hmm. that it seems that there are kind of two styles of this illustration. Most, if not all of the ones you showed by book side, mm -hmm. and some of the others are just an illustration with maybe five, six characters that look like a caption or mm -hmm. just saying yeah. what the illustration is. Mm -hmm. And then others you showed have the style that is more integrated, where the narrative of the text is on the same with block yeah. as the illustration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting because it suggests different possibilities for those wood blocks, mm -hmm. right, going forward. Um, and so I'm wondering about how often these illustrations appear in other books, in other contexts, because the ones with only the caption text mm -hmm. seem very reusable, which is very common in European mm -hmm. printing. You might get an image of, you know, King Henry the First, and then in another book, it's yeah. Charlemagne, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. et cetera, because it's, doesn't matter, it's very easy to do, right? Mm -hmm. The ones with the full text on there, which again is mm -hmm. something that you just don't really find that kind of layout very much in European printing, just because of the nature of letterpress and woodblock on together. Mm -hmm. You know, those, I'm sure you could, some had a whole story, it seemed like, like of the cultivating the land of the elephant. So you might hang it on the wall or you might put it in a different book, but it's mm -hmm. not quite the same capability of repurposing as the illustration that doesn't have mm -hmm. is that is that a, 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 am i are these actually two different kinds of illustration mm -hmm. or are just are about the, the block itself or are you talking about the kind of the image well because the one you showed with the text mm -hmm. across the top that is right. that's one that's yeah. a wood block with both the illustration and the text right. all on it right but right. it's a lot of text so yes. it's not the kind of wood block you could then very easily pull out and put in a different book for a different story Whereas the Hokusai, I mean, the picture of Hokusai where we see him through the window, you know, could be could be Hokusai, but it could be any writer mm -hmm. or something, right? Could be mm -hmm. used for someone else. So I'm curious about how, whether these images appear in other books, whether we can kind of trace the same block mm -hmm. through other books. And then secondly, I'm interested, mm -hmm. is it just an accident of kind of, uh, these are the only ones I've ever seen. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's just an accident of the ones you put up that hokusai's all seem to fall into that other category. I could imagine a story where like he was a prize artist. You wouldn't want a lot of narrative on there because you'd want to be able to sell them also individually mm -hmm. as a work of art or, you know, exactly on the wall. Julie will know better than I, but my impression is that these are unique because he was he was an incredibly just non-binding prolific draftsman and artist, and mm -hmm. he changed over he changed his artistic name, he changed his style, he changed his subject, you know, over his very long you know, decade decades long. Uh, oh, uh, and so I don't know, Julie. Do you know if these are? Yeah, you know, I will add this too, Zach. That remember that the wood block that was in the pages are folded, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. the wood block is there. Right, with folds here. Mm -hmm. Typically, they don't. It's not like a European case. We have a small piece that then you can move to another mm -hmm. thing. They tend not to do that. They tend to more yeah. print them and either print them until they die mm -hmm. and recarve them, or say, "Oh, this isn't selling well. Let's shave this down and start over." Mm -hmm. We don't really see the not not in this kind of book. Mm -hmm. Do you see it with sheet prints, particularly a uh, Beautiful women, they'll just change the name on them, but not typically. Which is different than saying there might have been dozens and dozens of editions of, of reprints or of, of this edition right. of this book using the same woodblock. So right. rather than. But you wouldn't pull one of the woodblock out of, say, the story of with the elephants and like put in a different book that's like 10 stories about elephants. Right. No, <laughs> I, I would love to see it, but I can't think of the case where I see that. Can you think of one? No, 
you know, some of the chunks of your desk. You know, Which is interesting because the unit of the block is is it's just a single spread, right? Right. So it's very easy to that imagine okay. putting it to some other use, but you're saying that really were imagined as a unit of a book. Yeah, and yeah. then you would sell you might sell those on to another publisher, sure. you know, to be used into that whole set. Mm -hmm. And those mm -hmm. people have, I mean, those, those are real property blocks that right. you would block themselves. So. so, I mean, then looking at the You Can't Tell a Book by Its Cover kinds of, of books and the illustrations that are in them, I mean, if, if you are reading sequentially, mm -hmm. do the illustrations bear relation to the text or are they totally free floating? Are you surprised by the illustrations when you when you get to them? Right. Uh, I mean, some of the spreads you showed of the, you know, the warrior who was very elaborately dressed and he was moving through the air, and then the the women who were covering covering their eyes. Like, do they relate to one another in a way that that a reader would understand, or, or are they just random pleasures that you come across? Right. Yeah. So I think that that early in the the the. Uh, Illustrated filial pieties, the the texts that are the Confucian or the you know the Chinese text with the exegesis and so on, and even if there are there are illustrations, they're not really directly going to the text at all. So they're they're more decorative, like keep the reader keep you turning the page literally. Uh, but the the other pages are those are most of the texts are the short texts are identifying the warrior or uh, telling about what the incident is. So we, these are all such famous stories that you know, just in a short few words uh, are enough to because you, you might have seen it from Wikipedia, you might have read it, read the whole story, and you might have heard a well storyteller uh, telling about it. So it's been assumed to be shared um, narrative and uh, cultural knowledge that everybody has. So, I, I mean, do the books have more, especially the what you see is what you get? I mean, do they have more the character of, of miscellanies, um, or or is there some kind of internal structure that would make sense to to the reader? You know, I this is a good question. I I think we're not because the, the the types that we don't have represented here that there are these encyclopedic taxonomies mm -hmm. of everything, all the knowledge that you need to know in, in life, literature, ethics, morals, everything. Um, and those are really, and that's the, the very rich, uh, very, Elizabeth Duff Berry of um, Berkeley has written wonderfully about all the miscellanies. But these are, I think these are these are kind of artist books. Um, these are to for the pleasure of the, of the image, I think, uh, and to, to to enjoy looking together these stories and this shared cultural knowledge. Uh, Somebody Peter, Peter has raised his cartoon hand. <laughs> yes. Hi, hi, Anna. Uh, thanks so much for, for that talk. Is it possible to go back to the woodblock, to actually show the woodblock? Uh, this is a follow-up from Zach's question. So if it's possible to go back. So I take it as you go back and look at that, I mean, part of Zach's question was, uh, you know, how much are these reused and... This one has obviously been extensively reused. Uh, not the further back. There was actually a, a little. Uh, there was another. That's that one. That's the one. So you can actually see first of all that there's a plug being put in at the bottom, and where that was originally, the, the actual text. There must be a reversal of one or the other. I don't know which it is. The woodblock's been reversed because when you actually print you reverse so that i don't quite understand how the wood blocks come out that way or the same way as the text but but the text anyway towards the bottom where that um where the plug is on the right hand side of lighter wood that is actually must have been drawn in by hand you can even see it you can see that the letters below the character that looks like as 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 a z a z Mm -hmm. So you see the Z, yeah. And if you go down below that, on to the, actually go back to the text, mm -hmm. to the, the other side, that, that must have been drawn in there. And you can see the margin has also been actually written in. And again, there's a break at the top of the woodblock, just on the line, not in the text itself, but at the very top, mm -hmm. uh, the very the very top, as you go along that top line, mm -hmm. at, uh, both at the side and at the top. So this is a very well-worn 
woodblock that's actually must have been reprinted many many times so to me it raises two problems one of which is uh what we now call print on demand mm -hmm. once you've got a woodblock you can reuse it for any amount of time so part of the problem is that you know when you date something with a woodblock it could be printed 50 years later i mean we actually have got examples in europe of woodblocks being used for two to three hundred years so literally you've got you've got no idea when they're printed and one of the few ways that you've got of dating these is actually by wear and tear so you've got here a very good example of very heavy wear and tear um and presumably they're still reusing it because why would they have bothered to put this plug in otherwise i mean it's a weird plug because it doesn't do anything i mean it's not it's not you'd still have to write it in and you have to write it in for every copy so every single copy that you printed, you'd actually have to write in the missing uh, characters. Uh, so I, I think uh, <laughs> Julie and Linda and I are going to gesticulate here. I think what this, uh, uh, this is supposed to be shown in a mirror or something. It's, yeah. it's the first image, right? Flip the yeah, they flip the digal image <laughs> in a mirror, right? As if yeah. in a mirror. And so, yeah, you know, right brother. But this would have been, I mean, they often did. Either, this was from a uh, the notes on verses from private academies, so it's a school book, uh, kind of a textbook. And so maybe there's a, there's a uh, update. This is number the twenty second or something. So they have to update this here. Um, and right. this is was actually from a book showing about how different ways they made repairs and changed. Yep. For example, maps often there were maps were often printed, uh, were also printed with. By, right. uh, by graphic printing, so if they, somebody moved or a uh, shop closed or something, that that was one way they could uh, uh, correct those. But I, I, I right. think it was very unusual for it to be just handwritten in. I think it was, it was printed on the left here. It's printed, and this I think what we're looking at it just says twenty two in each volume twenty two mm -hmm. of this particular book. So for mm -hmm. some reason, they put this other plug in, and. Uh, the block has remained with this plug, but at some earlier point, they must look to me like there was an earlier plug. Doesn't it look like mm -hmm. right here? Right here. You can see a double line. So there could be some kind of tanky tanky that's going on with the block. <laughs> but the sheet is printed. Print the sheet is printed before. The sheet is words. printed before the block. But could exactly. you could yeah. volume twenty one? You know, do they have a little plug that say 20, 19, <laughs> the beginning of each volume? Well, I, I just you have to look at this and find out if it used to be volume 24 or 21, and, or whoever got these blocks didn't get all, all the volumes, so they just changed right, the volume they changed numbers. The numbers right? So there's something funky going on there. But you, oh, you make a good point about dating too, and this how wear um, both to the sheet prints and, and books as well. Um, uh, there's often <laughs> the, the actual date of printing and the carving and printing are, are can be quite different, and wear can be uh, a very good, uh, useful way of, of dating. Uh, yeah. actually dating. What I don't understand about this plot is at the very top of the printed side, mm -hmm. we're missing the top character, yeah. yes. which is a block on the right. So, and that doesn't. I can't tell if there's a plug in the upper right. It looks like it printed very lightly. Or it's just badly printed. Like it was just printed. very badly it printed. Wasn't enough force. Yeah, it yeah. was maybe badly printed or badly printed. Yeah. Because it wants to have the very thin. But but the frame is actually broken. So the frame at the top, no, this is nothing to do. If you go, so the frame is broken, which shows it has been. So the the I've I've got the point, which is if you're saying that the they may have had lots of plugs so i've seen this in european printing too that you can have for instance a wood block of someone going to heaven or hell uh, on their deathbed and you put in a separate plug for heaven and hell so one plug you have for heaven and one you have for hell so you know th this is a technique it's actually i think a quite well established technique of this use of plugs so it interests me but so but there is that remains two separate points which is how you add these plugs and how many you plugs you're going to need to actually do uh and secondly the question of the breaks of the actual frame which is the thing i've seen most commonly mm -hmm. um when wood blocks get old that's how they they break particularly around the frames yeah. uh often before and and the last question about dating was one of the um 
one of the images you showed of that beautiful colored, um, the, the, the colored uh, frame around the pages, around the spread, oh, right. had incredible, uh, I'm taking it woodworm, uh, so yeah. bookworms. Yeah. And so that's another way that one, and it, the bookworms are all over it. And so there is actually now work by a guy in Philadelphia who's able to help date these things, how long the actual bookworms, and particularly if you can find earlier editions, the simplest way to just do it is if you can find similar copies, the bookworms necess will necessarily be more. There'll be more bookworms with time. So again, you can actually begin to get a sense of how long the blocks have been used for. Uh, yeah. Although our Philadelphia expert only knows about Protestant and Catholic bookworms. <laughs> <laughs> not, not Japanese. Yeah. But, but <laughs> this bookworm has only attacked the book. He didn't attack the block. Oh, he didn't. Okay. So that's what we're looking at here. Okay. The attack on the book itself. Yeah, and we have the book out here yeah. too. I like do yeah. recommend it. It's, yeah. it's, it's quite yeah. it's almost lacy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we have a question from the chat. Yes. Um, and it's from Davida Charney, who's a regular. Mm -hmm. um, I find myself a bit skeptical about the directory of virtuous people, mm -hmm. especially if designation came along with tax relief. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder whether there are texts telling the stories of ordinary people in Japan or only ones of well known fables. Oh, those particular in the example I gave in the Hiroshima area. Uh, <laughs> indeed, there, there, these people are being incentivized to present themselves as virtuous <laughs> and civically minded. Uh, but just like today, some people are altruists. Some people do it because they think it's right. Some people do it for the tax relief. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm actually have not I've, uh, seen pages of these. Uh, directories of, of actual residents. Um, and I think the point I was trying to make was that, that filial piety is can be construed in many different ways. For example, in the 24 exemplars, those are extreme examples of, for example, a, uh, a, a son, a filial son who allows himself to be uh, Bitten by mosquitoes, so his mother will not be bitten by mosquitoes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. These are like an unreasonable and masochistic kind of examples. And I think in the uh, in the pages that I've read of the actual directories of the people in Hiroshima, for Hiroshima area, they they weren't these kind of extreme examples. They were, you know, they, they were just the poor in, in at the Buddhist local Buddhist temple, or they. Uh, you know, uh, Learn to, to read well, or they, uh, you know, they were uh, good, good neighbors to in their community. So they weren't all the kind of uh, the extreme uh, masochistic or examples that, that are sometimes offered. I don't know if that answers your question. I think John has. Mm -hmm. uh, unless somebody else. Um, uh, was there another question? Oh. Okay. Um, thank you, and this is great stuff. Um, uh, and I, lo I love looking at these and amazing uh, how much more there is to look at in this incredible collection. Um, I'll just throw some things out. You can do what you want with them. Um, some of which are on the kind of big picture side of the story you're telling, and and then some are on the more like looking in closely. Um, I mean, I actually think that the genre of this kind of thing is, is a, as a sort of more European Americanist, is actually sort of familiar. It's a kind of early modern genre, conduct literature, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and this, yeah, yeah, great, great characters to emulate. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a sort of a way in which there's a kind of comparative history of genres that we might find totally uninteresting and yet were were ubiquitous in a whole bunch of these cultures that almost overlap. Mm -hmm. I just think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always <clears throat> intrigued by the phrase you used, wildly popular, mm -hmm. and always want to ask, like, how do we know? What does that mean? Um, and, it, and I know that mm -hmm. having talked about this many times with Julie, how hard it is to answer those questions mm -hmm. and that you're working on it, so keep on going. Um, but I guess I wonder to make it into a question of is something you also implied a, a high degree of state sponsorship. I don't know if that's the right phraseology mm -hmm. here, but 
what, what's the articulation between <clears throat> a shogunate clearly working to instill cultural values and, and, and paying for it and subsidizing it and paying the best the best guy to be on the case versus popularity reprinting or is it a versus situation or is this just an example where state sponsorship really worked and people really read the books that people sold them to or, or, or you get the best illustrator and everybody's going to want to look at his picture so I just think there's an interesting interplay there and maybe it is about co-opting the best this yeah. sort of yeah. The state the state and its art mm -hmm. i guess so uh, following the question i mean in the state sponsor mm -hmm. state sponsored text will you have as much chinese or mm -hmm. is the chinese weeded out in the state sponsor mm -hmm. edition mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um and maybe a last thing mm -hmm. this is totally different i really love and i just think there's a kind of high artistry when you get the the I know Julie is illustrating, you know, the block that's folded on a sheet, but, mm -hmm. you know, the multiple blocks, the mm -hmm. concept, the artist conception that goes across a spread, mm -hmm. the, the sort of one third, two third thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some examples here of what I would call, um, you know, basic modalities and really high end <laughs> work. Mm -hmm. uh you know that's one and there was some uh, the, the one with hokusai himself where he's like yeah. leaning across the page and yeah. you know and um so anyway those are some thoughts thank you thank you so much uh, yeah and i didn't even get to this and i hope uh those of you in the room will have a chance to look at these these are some of these vertical uh threads so you actually have to turn uh, turn the book yeah. uh and i would <laughs> i can't even do it with my with uh, <laughs> zoom here uh, but you know, this we've been looking at the book in this way, and then all of a sudden we turn it over because there's a, uh, again, some kind of uh, fantastic uh, story with a, a man with a bronze zing a vessel on his head and writing writing poetry. I don't know. There's some kind of big story there, but there are many uh, spreads like this that are vertically oriented, and they're just cool. lots of lots of fun and and so uh, here's the virtuosity and um, the, uh, another version of the wave here too, but this time. A warrior uh, leading, back, leading back some kind of dragon uh, that's coming in on the way too. Do, do we know how much he got paid? Yeah. No. no. But you know, in, in response to, and I, I know Julie's uh, done a lot of research on this too, but booksellers uh, and publishers kept good records. Yeah. Um, so, and there were, you know, hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of booksellers who, who, whose records remain. And uh, thanks to Japanese scholars who, who look into these things and uh, you know, kind of circulation numbers and sales numbers and, and so on and so forth, I think one can get an idea of I don't know the exact numbers because I have not looked at, into those itself, but the ubiquity of these of these books and uh, the, the many different editions mm -hmm. and types of illustrations, the types of artists who did the illustrations and types of covers and um, some uh, some are published domains, uh, local local entities, military um, political entities, published sponsored publishers sometimes. The shogunate less often, uh, but the commercial publishing industry was really where the action was. Um, and um, so, you know, and, and the commercial publishers willingly you know, put these out, not just to curry favor with the state, I think, but because they were you know, part of, part of uh, public discourse. And, um, you know, maybe it was a, a way to protect themselves from, from censorship from, from the shogunate uh, or the the naval authorities coming in and shutting them down mm -hmm. or, or arresting them. So there, there may be some, some of that too, just towing the line, but then you, know, you turn the page and then you get the good stuff. Right. And, and forgive, forgive me if you mm -hmm. told us, and I, I um, that was a dumb question. When Hokusai illustrates the book, is Hokusai's name on the cover or? Yes, or it's not? not on the cover. The, on the cover, there's just the title slip. Yeah. But when it, 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 it's uh, the opening spread there, it, it, it had, uh, in fact, it, it has his name on the right. And that's the first name you see. Um, so, so he's the most, right. he's the draw for, for that yeah. one. And, and Julie has taught us to ask, do we know whether it's Hokusai or Hokusai's daughter? <laughs> 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 yeah, we're learning. <laughs> And so, if we know that these are books by themselves, no, we don't. Julie, we don't. Uh, oh, uh, oh, there's a good, good yeah. It could have been her. Well, well, Julie, Julie, Julie will have us believe that they're all 19th century French forgeries. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs>
Well, there's actually some wonderful contemporary movies about Hochstein's daughter and his relationship with the daughter. But the, the top down, bottom up thing, and that is very useful schematic, obviously, that explains why. But, you know, so the shogunate may, the shogunate may want these books disseminated because they're pretty good ideologically. Mm -hmm. But so that's kind of top down. Bottom up, like in each household, there's at least one person who probably really likes filial piety. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah. So the dad, has, you know, that's bottom up in a way, but yes. it's, it's, it's not really very different. Right from the third. so yeah, it can sure. be hard to really untangle. But I, I also like a lot of scholars uh, have done uh, work that I kind of drew on too, or you know, women engaging in literacy, which is a really important like, you know, concept too. And that discourse is ethical discourses and encourage that kind of activity. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> anyway, you could. Well, it's actually, and I've been think, thinking that these are probably also being used at the Petakoya, the yeah. temple schools, mm -hmm. and being used by um, certain kinds of tutors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe I forgot who it is, but there's someone who, who wrote about family structures saying that the father is actually in charge of the education of the children. Mm -hmm. um, the mothers were not necessarily the ones who were doing that, they just wanted to, but it was part of the regular practice. The thing that struck me, I mean, in this conversation, really, I mean, it's so boring. I'd like to comment more on your question, um, which is that the one that you have here, that's the 24 paradigm of filial piety, strikes me as the boring textbook kind, mm -hmm. right? That you're going to have to read. And the hoax I ones are like, let's riff on that and make money. Absolutely. Right. So, um, yeah. You um, it to me. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, I think it's really hard for, to, I mean, to know the numbers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have anybody done a kind of how many were printed in each year of the boring kind or the exciting mm -hmm. kind because it seems like you have to have a book. It's like producing Bibles, it's like a regular market. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that goes back to, to your your question too um, about numbers. Yeah, I'm that's sure. not something I'm yeah. not. Well, and not sure we're in a place yet where we can actually do that because we don't have you know, a way to sort of scrape the metadata and do all that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, I have no doubt that there's definitely scholars who are working on precisely that. And let's say that we here in this country owe a lot to Japanese yeah, scholars. I mean, I have another question. I mean, you have the, the Hiroshima mm -hmm. um, directories of virtuous people. Mm -hmm. Um, how how localized were these publications? How or how yeah. much did they travel? Um, um, yeah, so this is um, so what what area is this? Um, this is all of you know the, of Honshu, the main island of Honshu, but this is all of, kind of the very western end of that, where there are at the time there were. I think heavily, fairly heavily populated domains, but also rural areas and castle towns. Um, so, so they were definitely regional, uh, but a lot of kind of political um, structures were also also regional. I mean, the Shogunate was in Edo, um, so they they can be construed as both as kind of regional domainal uh, publication activities. Uh, so it's part of I think regional identity. So, but, so are there? There are regional differences in the kind of filial piety book that would be published in one place versus the kind of filial piety. Yes, I think local political authority, yeah. the, the local daimyo or you know, mm -hmm. the ruler of the domain would have definite priorities in, in this kind of publication and the value of its book. Did, did sometimes practices have or dedications speak to any of that localism? Like, here's, here's something for the particular boss or not? Or are they not really set up that way? I'm thinking of, again, sorry, Europeanizing, but you know, the, the patronage model of okay. everything needs a dedicatory preface. Uh, everything needs a not, appeal to who's paying the bills. No, I have not seen that. Work that way. Mm -hmm. The prefaces tend to be more kind of anonymous, and you know, somebody of, of, of renown will 
you know, say something praiseworthy about the board or something general, but they don't usually say something. Okay, but, the, but there is not a great difference between what it means to be yeah. filially <laughs> pious in Edo versus what it means to be filially pious. I think, probably pious is. In, I think in there probably Kyoto. is, especially in Edo, where you're the, yeah. the closest to, to, to the Udemy, <laughs> very right, as opposed to the domains who are all huh. obedient, they're all in a filial relationship with the center. Yeah. yeah. Um, may I take us back to a moment where sure. we were talking about the logistics of printing? Yeah. Um, so if they were printing with woodcuts and every paper, mm -hmm. every page is one woodcut, doesn't that mean that you would accumulate so many wood blocks? Yeah. Doesn't that create storage issues? Yes. And absolutely. doesn't it mean that one workshop could only publish a certain number of books because they just logistically couldn't store that many wood blocks. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of the real shortcomings with wood block printing is the space it takes to store those wood blocks and yeah, and the value of the wood too, right? And 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 yeah, and it's more than the books themselves, it's the wood blocks that have the value in it too. So yeah, no, I mean that's one reason that that model of printing, even though it worked so well <laughs> for so many centuries, was was eventually abandoned because unlike letterpress or uh, other forms of mechanical printing, it takes a lot of space. And wood is very expensive. They did have storehouses, though. I mean, they did. And if you go to Korea, you can actually see. I don't know. I, I've not seen this in Japan. I've seen pictures of like you know places that have these wood blocks. But there's a uh, temple in Korea. Yeah, they heard it. Yeah, it's like massive storehouse. Yeah, there's a and it, 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 it's you know kind of the the canon of Buddhist pieces, and they're all preserved there. And it's, it's particularly uh, you know so, uh, good uh, kind of H natural HVAC to preserve. That's what, another thing too that the board the, the climate can affect the, the blocks too. So it's very tricky. Actually, going back to the director of virtuous like local people in Kyoto, like I was just curious, do we have any evidence of these virtuous people themselves would have would have sponsored this project? Like, I would assume that like I don't know, like I, I just like maybe from the sort of the contemporary perspective, I'm not as interested in reading about the virtuous <laughs> stories about people who live right next to me, but I would probably want to pump out like a story like that about myself if there's some like very real like incentives for me to do that. Like I don't have to pay my taxes. This is very real. I'm trying to follow my time right now. So like, if there's any way for me to not do that, like I would get my story like how virtuous as I am. Send that to the IRS. Good luck with right. that. Like, <laughs> that. So like how so virtuous. So I was just curious, like, do we have any sort of sources suggest that that might have been some of the cases, or do we just don't have any evidence at all? I mean, the people were putting those stories out there, or pu actually publishing. It means that people would advance their own stories. So, like, are they like paying those publishers? Like, maybe publish No, stories? these were published by the domain. Oh, so the right. domain was like in charge of those. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. and are, are they a mix of prominent people and, you know, the virtuous cobbler who, like, can barely put food on his table? Yes, I think there okay. are various classes of people. Can so, you ask me all of your country? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be in the next director. <laughs> well, and, and and I hope that we can all enter such an index yeah. with illustrations. There we go. <laughs> <By one side. laughs> in heaven. <laughs> so I don't know how virtuous we are, but I think Anne is quite virtuous <laughs> um, and has just given us much to think about. And, not everybody may know, or maybe you'll know that she's been up since four o'clock this morning, <laughs> I believe. So okay, um, not only is she virtuous, she is quite heroic, and we have, <laughs> we have much to thank her for, and also many books to look at on the table. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for coming. Marcy.